So now we're going to look at a learning theory from cognitive science. It's particularly relevant to educational technologies and instructional design. This is the cognitive load theory. Now this relates to understanding how our brain has um, two sorts of memory. We have working memory, sometimes called short-term memory, and we have long-term memory, where we consolidate our long-term learning. Now, we draw into our working memory what we see and what we hear, and also what we've experienced in the past from our long-term memory. But our working memory only has a certain capacity. Now, depending upon the research studies, between four and nine elements. But if we exceed that, then it makes learning much more difficult. So, for example, if you're trying to listen to more than one person speak to you at once. That's two different streams of auditory information coming in and it can overload your working memory, your ability to understand what's happening. Likewise, if you're watching a lecture presentation and if it's a nice simple concept, then having some text and a nice diagram and listening to the speaker at the same time may fit well within your working memory and you have no problems and it's a nice rich learning experience. But if it's a really complicated concept that you've really got to think about and really understand, then having someone speak to you about it while you're trying to interpret the diagram and also potentially read some text may easily overwhelm your working memory and it makes it harder to understand and learn what's being presented. So within cognitive load theory, there are three types of cognitive load. The first is intrinsic cognitive load, and this has to do with the inherent difficulty of what you're learning, how complex the task is. And we want to try to make that task as simple as possible as educators, as instructional designers, and through the use of educational technologies. Then we have extraneous cognitive load. This is the cognitive load added to the task by how it is presented. So in the previous example, if we're presenting a really complex concept using lots of different types of modalities, so speaking about it while also having the learner have to interpret a diagram and also read some text at the same time, would be examples of a high extraneous load. And in our development of educational technologies, we should try to minimize extraneous cognitive load when we have complex concepts. If it's a really simple concept that's within working memory, then having multiple different modes can be more effective. But if, it's, if it goes beyond that capacity limit of their working memory, that's when it becomes a problem. And then we have germane cognitive load. Now this is the um, the complexity of the concept and how it is then placed into our long-term memory. Now this often happens through sleep where we consolidate our long-term memory and dreams play an important part of that process. But it can also occur as we're awake as well. But it's the process of um, consolidating our working memory into long-term memory formation. So they're the three types of cognitive load. Our intrinsic cognitive load, where we try to simplify things as much as possible. Our extraneous cognitive load, where we try to reduce the complexity of how information is being presented. And our germane cognitive load, where we try to maximize the capacity to um, turn into long-term memory what we're learning. Now, I've given you a paper to engage with, to read about this in some more detail. So have a look at that paper, and it goes through and explores some instructional effects, some implications cognitive load theory has for how we go about developing um, educational technologies and instructional materials and teaching. So the first is the worked example taking students through and working through a problem or a process with them is a way of assisting in their cognitive load. So we take them through solving problems. 
Now, split attention is where it becomes difficult to focus on more than one aspect of that at the same time. Most common is if um, you've got more than one person trying to talk to you at the same time. If you're at a party and you're trying to listen to three or four conversations at once, it easily overloads your capacity in terms of working memory. But the same can happen with different modalities. This is the next um, effect, where if you're being presented with different or the same information in different means, um, having to listen to something at the same time as you're trying to read something or look at something in a diagram uses two parts of the brain. Our auditory cortex processes information coming in through our ears, and our visual cortex processes information that we're seeing in a diagram or reading text. And so having to process those in different ways, both draw upon working memory, and having to combine them com um, then can overload your working memory. So trying to reduce the complexity of different modalities can be important. If it is a complex concept, if it's a really simple concept that can fit within our working memory, then having more than one modality can be of a benefit. Now the transient aspect, or the transient effect, is where if you're learning a complex concept, you want to have the main concept be relatively permanent, and then you can explore different um, sub-elements. So for example, learning about virtual reality, as we did last week, um, that's the main concept which is relatively permanent in that learning process. But we then explored different aspects in a more transient way, or chunking. Um, so we looked at the different types of headsets, and we explored those. Then we looked at the different aspects of virtual worlds, and we explored those. Then we looked at different ways of engaging with virtual reality. So they were occurring in different transient um, modes, but the more permanent mode was the concept of virtual reality. Next effect is called redundancy. This is where we try to simplify things. Now there's lots of information available on any concept that we're trying to teach. But if we present that all to a learner, that can very quickly overload their working memory. So we need to focus in on the most important aspects and remove the redundant elements so that we only present to the learner what they need to learn in order to understand the concept um, and reduce the extraneous material that's being or could be presented. Then there's a thing called expertise reversal. Now, for a novice learner, something, someone learning something for the first time, then you want to go through and present detailed information to them about a concept and help them consolidate that in their learning. But if they've got a level of expertise, going back over that same material again can actually be um, detrimental. Now, we want to do some level of consolidation, but you may have experienced this yourself. If you've learned, let's say if you're doing a fire safety um, instruction, we often have fire safety instruction, having to go back over material that you've learned many times before can actually disengage you with learning the new material that is important that you learn. So reducing or accommodating expertise reversal can be important in designing instructional material and educational technologies, where you don't want to just go over the basics again and again simply because you can. Um, at some point you need to focus on the new material that is important to learn without going back over redundant material. And finally, there's an effect called working memory depletion. We've talked a bit about this, but this is where we can overload working memory. Now, there are ways then of regenerating that. The most common is where we have a long period of time um, and often involving sleep, where we can consolidate our working memory into long-term memory. But we can also do it in a more short-term process by breaking up learning by having um, little activities that don't have a lot of cognitive load, but it allows time for our working memory to consolidate some of the complex concepts that we've been working through. So if we just kept doing com complex concepts one after another, 
that would be difficult. We wouldn't have time then to replenish our working memory. But we can break that up with little activities that don't necessarily involve a lot of um, working memory to help with that process. So where this becomes imp most important for educational technologies and instructional material is around multimedia, which when it was first developed, we thought that having lots and lots of different modalities, um, different types of media presented to a, a learner at once would be more beneficial. Showing them diagrams and images and video and text and also explaining it to them and talking to them about it would be a more effective process. And it can be if the concepts are very simple and we don't exceed working memory. But if the concepts and modalities are such that we um, exceed working memory, then it can very easily become detrimental to the learning process. So you need to balance that in developing educational material um, and using all of those various effects in how we approach that. In particular, you need to think about bringing things in through the ears and the eyes, auditory and visual modalities. Of course, they use two separate parts of the brain and require each require a draw upon um, our working memory. Okay, so there's another paper for you to read through and engage with and look at the implications of cognitive load theory to the development of educational technologies and instructional material. And then just going back over those concepts again, from this paper, it does so in a slightly different way. So have a look at these effects again from this different perspective based upon the reading. Um, some of the new aspects that bring in are the imagination effect. This is where we can have students imagine what they're about to learn. Now where this is useful, let's say we're going to be talking about computer games. If I ask you to first imagine what you're going to learn about computer games, that then draws upon your long-term memory some concepts into your working memory that can be useful in relating it to what you're about to learn. And then as you learn material about computer games, as you'll be doing next week, um, it then provides linkages between your memories, your short-term and your long-term memories, that assist with memory formation. So the process of imagining draws upon existing understandings into your working memory that makes the learning process easier. So just an interesting effect that has been found through cognitive science. Um, we've talked a bit about isolation of interacting um, elements. Now this is the chunking process, such as with virtual reality, where we learnt about different elements of virtual reality um, separately. And then once those had been learned about separately, we could then chunk them together as um, individual elements into our working memory. So all of the understanding about headsets could be reduced into a chunk. All of our understanding of virtual worlds could be reduced into a chunk. All of our understanding of um, the application of virtual reality and different ways of using it could be reduced into a chunk. And then those three elements could be brought into our working memory and we could discuss and explore virtual reality as a whole concept. Whereas if we had to bring into our working memory um, and explore as a whole concept all the different headset types and augmented reality and virtual reality and also bring in all the different ideas about virtual worlds and all the different applications of virtual reality, that would well and truly overwhelm our working memory capacity and make learning more difficult. Um, the guidance fading effect is again related to expertise where we want to gradually reduce the influx of new ideas and allow the learner to work with what's in their working memory to apply that to solve problems. Um, if you're continuously introducing new material, new instruction, then that's less capacity for students to actually consolidate and work with what they've learnt to solve problems, to do activities, and so forth. So we um, reduce the, the guidance um, in terms of instruction to allow 
uh, students to work with what they've incorporated into their working memory. And finally, there's the goal-free effect. Now, this is where it's been found that sometimes it's beneficial not to give students an explicit goal in terms of their learning because it allows them to explore other possibilities and to bring in other concepts and to link to other concepts in their long-term memory. If you give them a very tightly defined, clear goal, then they will only bring in what's required for that and work in terms of their working memory around what's explicitly needed. It's too narrow. So sometimes not providing a clear, explicit goal and making it more of an open-ended problem that we're exploring, such as say if we were exploring the use of games in learning. Now, I could give you a really, really explicit um, uh, goal around that where we're going to develop a text-based game that we have an um, explicit narrative that students then work through uh, various choices and come up with a learned outcome as a result of that game. That's a very narrow exploration of games. A more open-ended approach around a goal-free um, engagement of games is for you to think about all the different games you've played, not just computer games, but any sort of game, and that we're going to be learning about games and how they relate to education. And so that now allows you to bring in from your long-term memory all of your different understandings of games and play and computer games and board games and card games into your working memory. And as we then explore games, it'll be done in a much more, um, in a way that can incorporate a whole lot of different pathways that wouldn't necessarily have occurred if I'd given you a much more explicit goal around developing a specific game in a particular way. So that's the goal-free effect. So there's a whole range of different things around cognitive load theory that we've just explored. So think about those and think about how you might take um, into consideration um, these approaches when you're developing your own um, learning experiences with educational technologies and your hybrid learning activity.